goodbye to the Sierra District Area Chamber of Commerce Congressional District to debate. I'd like to ask uh, Congressman Ron Barber to come out. Two minutes, so it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks. 
Well, thanks, Phil, and thanks to the Sierra Vista Chamber, and thanks everybody for coming out tonight. What a great crowd. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to open up with a question. How many of you think the country is going in the right direction? Issue 
you would address immediately after taking office and how would you go about addressing it? Thanks, Bill. As I'm traveling throughout the district, the single most important issue is still the economy. Uh, in Tucson, it was just highlighted as the city in the country that's lost the most jobs since August 2009. But this economic stagnation is not just reserved for Tucson. Down here in Sierra Vista, we're hovering around an 8% unemployment rate. In 2013, we had a 61% drop in uh, permits for new homes to be built. We, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the revenue down from accommodations, which is the hotels, is, is down 25%. We've lost over 500 jobs here in Sierra Vista. And a lot of that is because the economy is hurting here, not just because of what's happening nationally, but because the federal government, the uncertainty, what's happening in the defense spending and the Ford. So the first thing I'm gonna do is fight to grow our economy. We have got to get people back to work. We've got to get small business to be able to grow again, get access to capital, get the federal government off their necks so they actually can uh, take their ideas and bring them to market and people can buy homes and buy cars and meet the American dream. So I am gonna champion small business. I'm gonna champion, and I know we'll probably end up talking about it, the Ford, because this city is in existence primarily dependent on the Ford. So I'm gonna champion making sure that this Ford stays as a national security treasure. I'm gonna champion that we bring new businesses here to grow our economy, because we can't pay for our security, our defense, or border security unless we have a strong economy. So because of the difference in our philosophies and because of Mr. Barber's record, I have the National Federation of Independent Business who's behind me. The National Home Builders are behind me. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce behind me. The Associated Builders and Contractors, General Contractors, the Restaurant Association, everybody who cares about the economy has looked at his record and looked at my record and my philosophy, and they're behind me in this race. And so there's one person who is not just going to have words, but actions to champion economic growth. Thank you. Mr. Barber, you get, you get the same question. If you want me to repeat it, I can. Yes, please. Okay, what is the single most important issue you would address immediately after taking office, and how would you address it? Well, I believe that the most important issue facing all of Southern Arizona, there are specific issues facing certain segments, is the economy and jobs. We obviously have a huge problem in our country. The recovery has not been fast enough. But since I went to Congress as a former small business owner with my wife for 22 years, I've taken the knowledge of small business, what it takes to operate, to make a profit, to keep the doors open. I've taken that to the Small Business Committee, where we have already passed legislation out of that committee to deregulate small businesses, to increase access to capital. Before we left for the recess, I voted for a jobs bill that went past the, the House. Hopefully it'll pass the Senate. But we also have to hold on to what we've got. We have to grow jobs and we have to keep what we've got. And that's why I fought from day one to lead the charge to make sure that Fort Wichita did not lose the personnel that had been proposed. 2,700 positions? No way. We're going to fight, fight, fight to save the fort, and we've already done some work on that. And then finally, I want to say, APCO is a very important part of us community. It's a power plant near Wilcox and Benson. It employs 500, 252 people. In the audience tonight, we have a representative from APCO, Jeff Wolfather. I've worked with the plant to make sure that the one-size-fits-all mentality of the EPA does not prevail in Cochise County. We pushed back when they said they were going to make APCO increase its technology to reduce regional haze by spending $200 million. That's absurd. We pushed back and now we have a win-win situation where we're going to spend a lot less money to get even better results and we've saved 250 jobs in this great community. 250 high-paying jobs in a rural area is critical and that's part of the fight. Keep what you got and grow what you can. And working with the University of Arizona, I've been working to bring laboratory innovations to market through Tech Launch Arizona. We are going to bring the Arizona economy back by keeping what we have and growing what we need to grow. And I'm determined to make that happen when I go back to Washington. Are you better off than you were three years ago? The answer is definitely no. 
And I don't know about you, but the extreme agenda of coming out of the Obama administration, Nancy Pelosi, who you voted for speaker, and the EPA in overreaching in our communities related to this regional haze, I don't consider a $30 million bill a win-win. A $30 million cost is what's happened because of the EPA about particles that we can't even see and are not harmful to our health. And by the way, that compromise is, is up till 2017, well, but the new EPA rules will shut down that plant in 2020. This is the extreme radical agenda coming out of your party's administration, and, and the EPA will shut down that plant in 2020. Go do the research. I know you got a commercial coming out talking about how you're saving these jobs, but $30 million is too much for us to pay here when we're already hurting in Southern Arizona. So I'm gonna to fight to roll the, the EPA back so we have zero dollars being spent because we're taking care of it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. So you both touched on the economy and the first question. The second question is, by serendipity, a follow-up question about the economy. What is, in your opinion, the biggest hurdle to the economic recovery in our district? And how are you going to tackle it? That goes to Mr. Barber. Well, that's uh, a number of things, Bill, not just one single thing. First of all, we have to invest more in our education system so we can produce the educated and skilled workforce that companies need to come to Arizona, and they will come if we have the workers, and we have neglected education in this state. And my opponent, unfortunately, has said the federal government has no role to play in, in education. I disagree. $2.5 billion of federal money that comes back to the state from the Department of Ed, that's important to advance education. But let me just go back for a moment to my opponent's comment about Pelosi. Love to talk about Pelosi. I don't take my advice from Nancy Pelosi. There's only one Nancy in my life that I take advice from, and that's she's sitting in the front row, Nancy Barber. You know, that kind of blood throwing is really out of line. I have voted against the leadership over and over and over again. Nancy Pelosi doesn't care too much for me, but back to the economy, what we need to do. We need to have public education better. We need to bring jobs into the high-tech arena. We already have a foundation with solar, with optics, with bioscience, University of Arizona, when I was in Israel last year, I worked with the high-tech companies to attract them to be, begin startups here in Arizona at the Research Park near the University of Arizona. And right now we think there are going to be 11 new companies that could be coming here. There will be another visit to uh, Israel later this year. They're on their way to build their businesses here. We need to attract both local capital and capital from elsewhere. And that's how we're going to help grow this economy. Capital is the biggest problem getting in the way of growth of small businesses. Small businesses represent 70% of the economy in this country. If we don't help them by taking away regulations, if we don't help them by giving them access to capital, we are not going to regrow this economy. And that's been my, my job and my role since I went to, to the Congress and joined the Small Business Committee as a former business owner. I know how to do this. Unfortunately, my opponent has no experience in business. She wouldn't necessarily know how to do it. So this is a follow-up. What is the biggest hurdle to the economic recovery in this district, and what would you do to tackle it? Well, I think the biggest hurdle is Washington, D.C., actually. <laughs> so that includes uh, Congress not doing its job, and that includes federal agencies that are actually on the backs of small businesses. So small businesses do create 7 to 10 jobs. And it's great that you're on that committee, Ron, but the organizations that represent small business have looked at your record and decided to get behind me. And so if you look, I had a small business roundtable when NFIB came down uh, to endorse me a couple weeks ago, and members of the community sat around a table and talked to me about the problems that they're having related to the federal government. And there's overreach on every front. Whether it was Dodd-Frank, which is actually strangulating the housing industry, and, and people not being able to get access to capital loans. I refinanced my own house on a VA loan last year, and the paperwork got like five times as more before. It's ridiculous. It's not helping. It's actually hurting the housing industry. Whether it's the Affordable Care Act, which is anything but affordable. And it's hurting businesses because they're laying people off and putting them as part-time workers, and it's not giving them the ability and the confidence to grow. Right now, Washington, D.C. isn't doing their job of passing a budget 
and 12 appropriations bills every year. Congress's basic job to do that. The last time they did that, I think it was about 18 years ago. And what they do is create uncertainty in the economy so that people don't know whether they should hire or grow, or even if they've got capital, whether they should invest it. So we've got to get Washington, D.C. back to work. If there's no budget and no appropriations bills, you shouldn't be getting your pay, Ron, you and your other fellow members. They got to do their job and then get out of the way and stop being on the backs with their extreme agendas and the overreach of agencies so that businesses can grow and thrive and, and prosper. Thank you. Yes, I do. You know, uh, my job as a member of Congress, and I've been doing it since I got there, and even before as district director for Gavin Difference, is to push back on those federal agencies that want to have a one-size-fits-all strategy. It doesn't work. They've never even been out to the Southwest. They don't know who we are and what we are here. So we've been fighting really hard on behalf of APCO. That was a victory. Ask the workers at APCO if that wasn't a victory to save that plant and 252 jobs, Martha. I think they would say it is. And secondly, as far as the new APA rules are concerned, I don't agree with those. And I've pushed hard to make sure that APCO is at the table. They were at the table in Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago, arguing why it shouldn't happen here. And let me just remind you, my, my opponent, who is in charge of the House of Representatives? It's your party. They haven't brought bills to the table. Who shut down the government? Not me. Your party shut down the government. That is not leadership. We need to leadership in Congress. Not that. Next, next question goes to Ms. McSally. It's question number three. With the Affordable Care Act now implemented, how do you see this affecting businesses and individuals in our district, and what specific changes do you propose to the Act? So, the Affordable Care Act is anything but affordable. And look, our health care system was broken before the Affordable Care Act, uh, but the, the, uh, the Obamacare is the wrong diagnosis and the wrong cure. And while I'm talking to people around the community, what's happening is their premiums are going up. Again, at the Small Business Roundtable last week, we had somebody who had been providing health care for their employees for 15 years, and they're self-employed, but their, their, uh, their um, plan basically just got dropped, and they were kicked to the exchange, with the, with the uh, actual numbers actually going up, so it's unaffordable. I've had other employees that had 60, 60 employees that have dropped them down to 48. There's some that are now hiring people part-time, so it's actually hurting our economy. And by the way, I spent the evening in the emergency room, not because I was sick, but shadowing an ER doc at one of the Tucson hospitals. And there's people coming in now, and just because you have insurance doesn't mean you have health care. Because the deductibles are so high, some of them cannot get access, they're not going to their appointments, they can't pay for their medicine. And so it's not actually helping people get healthier because these deductibles are so high. I believe in patient centered health care, where decisions are between you and your doctor. And there's transparency and choice and health savings accounts. And you don't have the Obama administration telling you what kind of insurance that you need. I believe you shouldn't be directing employers to have a mandate to carry insurance. It has been stifling our economy. And we have got to make sure that people can get insurance if they have pre-existing conditions. We've got to allow kids who are 26 to stay on their parents' insurance. That's fine. And women should be charged more than men. But the Obamacare answer is mandates, penalties, and taxes that are hurting the economy and not actually bringing the cost of health care down. This is complicated. I've spent a lot of time talking to fault leaders in the community uh, up in Tucson and down here in Sierra Vista. And I'm committed to moving forward with solutions that are actually going to allow health care to be affordable, which is not this act. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Howard, you have a question? Well, this is a very important issue to everyone in the country, and I've certainly heard a lot about it from people in Cochise County and across the district. What they tell me is they like some things that are in the Affordable Care Act, and they don't like other things. But what they like, sir, who's laughing, they like not to have to be concerned about pre existing conditions barring them from getting insurance. I had met a, a woman whose husband uh, was denied insurance. He lost his job and he had diabetes. He couldn't get uh, 
uh, insurance because he had a pre-existing condition. Under uh, the Affordable Care Act, he now can get coverage. His life has been extended because of that. I have opposed many of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm on record, and that's part of the record I'm proud of. I fought against the individual mandate and the employer mandate and voted for both bills that would have postponed those mandates to give people more time to understand the system and the system to work. I voted to remove the congressional perks. Did you know that every member of Congress should be in the Affordable Care Act? I am, and we should be. We shouldn't ask citizens to do anything we're not willing to do. But what's wrong with that is the congressional staff and congressmen and women, they get a subsidy. That's wrong. And when that came to pass, I voted for a bill that said no subsidy for me and for anyone else in Congress. And when it couldn't pass the Senate, my wife and I sat down at the kitchen table and said, what are we going to do? And what we felt the only ethical and right thing to do was to spend that money that we got in supporting local charities. So every penny of that subsidy we get every month goes to local charities all across this district. That's the right thing to do, and more members of Congress should stand up and refuse these perks. We need to fix this bill. My opponent says repeal it, but has no real solutions of how to fix it. I say keep it and fix the problems. Like all big laws, we have to fix the problem. And that's what I went to Congress to do. Not to be uh, a slave to anybody or an answer to anybody in the Obama administration. I've opposed them right down the line when they were wrong. So we've got him on tape in 2009 on a bullhorn during the debate advocating for the more extreme version of the bill, including the public option. On the one end. On the other end, a few months ago, in a closed door Democrat retreat, it was leaked out, no press was supposed to be there, that Ron Barber was praising Obama for his leadership on Obamacare. It's in BuzzFeed, you can check it out. <laughs> like you can't be for Obamacare and be you can't be for Obamacare and be against paying for Obamacare. Okay? Because the, the taxes that you say you're against are actually the one trillion dollars that actually pay for this monstrosity. So we need thoughtful solutions. And you know, taxpayers would rather have their money in their pockets and not given to members of Congress for you to actually give to a charity. They'd rather have it in their pockets so they could give it to the charity of their choice. Instead of being a follower, leaders actually fix the problem. Instead of complaining about it, actually do something about it and get it done because you are in Congress. Thank you. This one goes to Mr. Barber first. In the next federal budget talks, what are your priorities in both spending cuts and funding increases? And please name some specific programs that you think should be targeted. This is uh, relatively easy, quite frankly. We have a report that comes out of the Gen Governmental Accountability Office, the GAO, every single year. <coughs> It identifies a whole range of programs in federal agencies that are either duplicative, don't work, unnecessary, or wrapped with fraud and abuse. And that amounts to almost $80 billion every single year. What happens? Everyone says, oh, it's terrible, and then they put the report on the shelf. Working with the bipartisan working committee or group that I'm a part of, we've introduced legislation that would require committees of jurisdiction to vote up or down on every single one of those recommendations to hold Congress accountable for those decisions that they are unwilling to make right now. So we have to make sure that we cut what we need to cut. And where I would plus up, I would plus up in our military because we are hollowing out the Army, we are retiring platforms that we need, we're, we're not building ships that we need. This is a dangerous and volatile world. We don't need a smaller military, we need a bigger military. That's one of my priorities going into next year, along with border security. We have funding in border security, but we need more, and we need more technology as well as people. We need to fix the border security problem here in Cochise County, and that will be a priority of mine going forward. In terms of increasing expenditures, those are two areas of importance to me, and I believe they're really important to the people of this community, and that's what I've been fighting for when it comes back to budget negotiations in the new year. But the other thing we're going to be fighting for is to make sure 
that the A-10 aircraft keeps flying and flying and flying because it's the best close air support we could possibly have for our troops on the ground. That's why I fought a battle to mobilize a bipartisan coalition of the Congress. 300 members of Congress voted for my amendment to keep the A-10 flying. That's a mission that has to be keep flying and we need the money to do it. That would also be a priority. It goes to the overall priority of supporting our military and our veterans. Thank you. Look, we've got to get our budget under control. We're $17 trillion in debt and growing, and we have got to address the spending problem that we have here. But I'll tell you what I will not do. I will not balance the budget on the backs of the men and the women who served, like my opponent agreed to do. He voted for a budget, the, the Ryan Murray budget that came out of the negotiations last year, that balance the budget on the backs of veterans. Behind closed doors, they decided, you know what, we don't want to cut all these other pet projects, so we're going to cut veterans benefits, disabled veterans, active duty military. And that thing came out, and those of us who have served and those who are watchdogs for veterans, we were outraged that that was included in that budget. But Mr. Barber, our current congressman, voted for that. He then makes excuses, and we try to fix that, but he voted for it. So look, we've got to sit down and we've got to address these issues. We've got to make sure we have a strong military. We live in a more dangerous world than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And we've got to make sure we have a military that is ready and able to address these threats. We've got to secure our border. We have got to make sure we are safe from the terrorists that are overseas, those that are on a generational challenge that are trying to hurt us. This is serious business. So we've got to go through that budget line by line We've got to make sure we get out the waste, the fraud and abuse, the frivolous programs, the overlapping. There's $200 billion in that GAO report, but we've got to make sure that we are safe and secure because we cannot have a strong economy if we don't have security. And we certainly can't pay for our security unless we have a strong economy. And so I'm committed to making sure that we have a budget that makes sense but ensures that we are not balancing on the backs of veterans like Mr. Barber did. Well, you just heard another example of how my opponent pays, plays fast and loose with the facts. The facts are this. The bill that we passed kept the government open for all services. And yes, it made an adjustment that I didn't agree with on the backs of veterans. And the day after that, along with colleagues, I introduced three pieces of legislation to restore those cuts. They were restored. I voted for it. And that is the real truth, not the half-truth that my opponent would like to suggest. Try to confuse the voters with her record and my record. I am proud of my record. People may not always agree with my votes, but they will always know where I stand. Unlike my opponent, who will change her positions without even acknowledging that she once had a different position. We'll be talking more about that tonight as we go through the various questions, I'm sure. But don't pay fast and lose with my record, Martha. You can't get away with it here tonight. Thank you. Okay, next question goes to Mr. Sally. You know, it's interesting that you both brought up uh, military spending. Yeah. With, the, with both wars winding down in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, when this question was written, that was the case. Yeah, right. So, here's, here's really the, here, here's the nub of the question. Do you believe that substantial savings or any savings can be achieved without jeopardizing national security with regards to military spending? Well, let me, let me just uh, correct one thing before I answer that question, which is on the A-10, I forgot to mention it. The A-10 is only funded until December 11th, okay? So look, I'm talking about the facts. I'm not making anything up. I'm talking about our current congressman's record and how he's trying to confuse the voters on what the truth is. The A-10 is only funded until December 11th. And the House version of the bill that he supposedly championed after he woke up from his slumber, after I alerted that the A-10 was at risk, has no money associated with it. So basically, the A-10s would be static displays sitting on the ramp, but no money to fly, okay? So don't be confused. 
budget. There's no money in the House versions of those amendments. If you're going to fund something that's not in the budget, you have to unfund something else. And when I worked for Senator Kyle, I watched this happen. You've got to find an offset, you've got to build a coalition, you've got to get it approved. He failed to do that. It's the Senate version of the defense bill that actually has the funding in it, and this won't be sorted out until after the election. So make no mistake, the A-10 is not funded. Now, on the question of our national security, we live in a more dangerous world than I have seen in my adult life. And so we are in a more dangerous world than pre-9-11. So we should not be winding down our defense spending. Sequestration is absolutely reckless. It's a long word for the failure of leadership. Look, we've got ISIS growing as a, as a serious threat, more capable than Al-Qaeda pre-9-11. We've got Iran marching towards a nuclear capability as a state sponsor, sponsor of terror. We've got Russia invading its neighbors. We've got Hamas throwing rockets uh, into uh, Israel. We've got China exercising and flexing its muscle in the South and East China Sea. We've got cyber threats that are coming. We have got to make sure we have a strong and capable military to defend against these myriad of threats. And the best thing that you can do if you care about this is send someone to Congress who has a background in this. Mr. Barber doesn't have any background in this. Just because I talked to Jackie Joyner Kersey doesn't mean I know how to run the hurdles, right? You need someone who actually has experience, not just talks to people who have experience, because this is complex and we need leadership now to make sure we're safe from these guys. Thank you. Two minutes to respond. Well, again, my opponent has engaged in half truth making here tonight. Let's talk about the eight ten. Come on. Start the clock on leader, please. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Barber, thank you. You know, the budget deadline that my opponent is talking about is December 11th. We passed what is called a continuing resolution. The wrong way to do business, in my view, we should pass a year-long budget. But that's what we did before we left. My opponent is suggesting that the entire government of the United States is going to shut down on December 12th because there's no budget. That's absurd. That's absurd. It's not going to happen. And the A-10 is going to be in that budget. The National Defense Authorization Act that I championed, the amendment I championed, has $650,000, $650 million for the A-10 to continue flying. That will be part of the negotiation between the House and the Senate. It will be funded. I'm certain about that because the government will be funded. Her party learned their lesson last year when they shut down the government. They saw what public opinion thought about that. They're not going to do that again. If they do, I can't imagine why they would do it. They won't do it. But now, let's talk about what are the priorities. As I said earlier, we have to make sure that we are ready to deal with the issues all across the globe. Over in China, we have a, a, a defense department that is loading up troops with assets to threaten their neighbors, to threaten Taiwan. We have to be ready for that. Putin is marching on. We have to be ready for him. We have to be ready for the Middle East. We have to make sure that the ISIS can go no further. We have to take the fight to ISIS. That group is the most barbaric and, so unfortunately, the strongest terrorist group we've ever seen in the world. We have to stop them, we have to dismantle them, we have to destroy them, and that's going to be a priority for our military going forward. And we have to take a look at how procurement is done in the Department of Defense. Not everything is spent wisely, as with every federal agency. I'm for making sure we tighten up the procurement and purchasing so that we can buy things at the right price. Ron, you're getting a little worked up over there. You're talking about how it's the wrong way for Congress to be doing business to have a continuing resolution, and I agree with you. It is the wrong way to be doing business, and again, in case you didn't get the memo, you're in Congress. And so leaders are actually ones who form and shape what we're going to do next, instead of sitting back and throwing pot shots and complaining about it. Do something to fix it. That's what people are looking for right now. Look, I'm glad you could recite those talking points, but you have absolutely no experience in national security. Not only do I have 26 years in uniform, but I've got two master's degrees. I worked for Senator Kyle on cyber terrorism and counterterrorism. I was teaching at the Marshall Center, and I was leading, before I retired, our counterterrorism operations in the continent of Africa. I have six deployments in combat zones serving at senior leadership positions. The best thing that we can do is get veterans and national security experts to provide oversight to this failed administration. I think we can all agree across the political spectrum, Obama is failing to lead in foreign policy and defense. 
And the best thing we can do is provide oversight to that with people who actually have credibility and experience.
I held a higher education roundtable to address these costs and bring them down, and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Certainly, there is uh, actually another area that I'm going to talk about that is uh, a very serious problem with expenditures and inappropriate expenditures. As a ranking member on the subcommittee on oversight and management of the Department of Homeland Security, I work very closely with my Republican colleague who is the chairman, and we are going after DHS to spend its money right. When it builds homes in Ajo for our agents, and they deserve good homes, at $650,000 $650, a pop, when the home value is $88,000, that's wrong. When they spend a billion dollars on the SBI net, it never worked, that's wrong. When they try to consolidate all of their headquarters into one location, and they're three times over budget, 11 years behind schedule, that's wrong. And we passed a bill for the House to hold the department much more accountable. I intend to do that as a monitor on that committee and with every other agency that does that kind of spending. It's wrong. The taxpayer deserves to have fiscal responsibility, and I'm a, that's one of my number one priorities. That will be what I'll do again when I go back next year. Thank you. As you both know, Fort Huachuca is the major economic engine of southeastern Arizona. Uh, of course, we have been seeing good paying jobs and contractor jobs being cut back. We've seen sequestration totally wreck some people's budgetary planning. We've seen other predicted budget cuts and also talks about the BRAC possibly coming up in the near future. What would you, uh, first of all, give us uh, uh, a 30 second elevator speech as to what you think is the most, uh, why Fort Huachuca is so important to our national defense, and what do you, what would you do in Congress to help protect the fort? The first question to you. Great, thank you. Well, as I mentioned, um, I've worked with a lot of the missions at the fort and had uh, six deployments overseas and two uh, joint tours working with the missions here at the fort. In fact, I worked with Major General Ashley on counterterrorism missions in Africa. And relationships matter, right? I know firsthand the national treasure that Fort Huachuca is. The intelligence personnel that graduate there have worked with in targeting and counterterrorism overseas, uh, making sure we keep our, our country safe. The uh, unmanned aerial systems are absolutely critically important part of our national security and use on the battlefield. We bring all the asymmetrical capabilities here at Fort Huachuca. The electronic proving grounds, NETCOM, the cyber capabilities, these are all asymmetric capabilities that we bring to the fight as America, and that, that's why this is a national treasure. We've got the only electronic proving grounds that's approved here by federal mandate, and so we need someone who's going to fight based on it being a national security treasure. The McGuire study showed that it's over $2 billion of economic impact. We all know that here. We know that jobs are dependent. But the fight in D.C. has to be one that's based on credibility, that understands those missions, that understands what those missions bring to our national security, what they bring to protecting men and women that are serving overseas. I have relationship with the senior, many senior Army leaders that are in the Pentagon right now. I know how the Pentagon works or not works. I mean, I've been there. I understand it. I know who to talk to. So what we need is someone serving in Congress fighting from this who has that background and that understanding. When I commanded my A-10 squadron uh, that I did, had to be ready to deploy anywhere in the world on 24 hours notice, we couldn't have done that without Libya Army Airfield, just as one other example of a mission that is absolutely critical here. And so when I get to Congress, I will make sure that they know that this is a place for national security treasures, all those missions, and we, know we need, need to grow missions here, not subtract them, because of the capability that this brings uh, to the fight and to keeping our country safe. Well, there's no question in my mind, having been involved with the fort since I got into Congress, and in fact involved with the fort long before that, uh, as the lead for Congresswoman Gifford is on military matters and border security. So I've been here many times. I've been able to talk with, meet with the personnel, the leadership of Fort Huachuca. There's no doubt in my mind, I think there's no doubt in anyone in this audience's mind, that this is one of the most important national security assets we have are not. The only other place in the world where you can do the kind of electronic testing 
uh, that is done at the fort is in Australia. We have to keep the fort viable, and we have to fight to make sure its missions not only uh, are saved, but actually are expanded. And actually, I've had some experience in saving a mission from the fort. The Army back east said, let's consolidate the electronic proving ground and bring it away from Fort Huachuca. I've joined forces with people here, the Huachuca 50 and others, we pushed back on the Army and they stopped that plan. We saved the electronic proving ground and it's still here and we will continue to fight for that. And also when it came to the 2700 personnel reduction that was proposed by the Army, I pushed back day one. I came to uh, Sierra Vista within four days of that announcement. I convened a group of stakeholders, elected officials, Chamber of Commerce and others, and said we have to be united in pushing back on the Army and putting our comments into the public comment period to make sure that they know you don't touch Fort Pachuca without a big fight. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep that fight going and we will win that battle. And let me just say this about the uh, importance of the fort to our economy. Clearly, it is the most important economic driver in all of Cochise County. We cannot let that go away. We must work, work together to save it. This should never be a partisan issue. We need to unite all of us together to save the fort and to expand its missions going forward. who's the right person with the right background and the credibility to fight that fight. Ron goes out and visits the base and gets briefing from the generals. And as a colonel, I was the one who was giving briefings to the generals, right, on, on what these what missions are, uh, to make sure that they understood the importance that are related to our missions to keeping America safe. So the issue is, who is the right person to fight this fight? We are not so much, there is a threat of a brack, but what's more of a threat is a BRAC without a BRAC, which means the Army and the Air Force is going to start just whittling away missions slowly, cutting down personnel, moving them and consolidating them elsewhere, and atrophying bases so that they just, like right before your eyes, they get smaller and smaller. This is a very serious threat. We're seeing it happen in the Air Force and the Army. We need to make sure we send the right person to Washington, D.C., who has the credibility to fight that fight. Picture yourself, you're here in southern rural Arizona, and you know there's this thousand foot level, and then there's down on the ground level. And uh, this being the Chamber of Commerce, we're talking about what programs at the federal level do you believe actually would support local job growth or new business development, which would increase employment in our district and perhaps diversify our economy from just being dependent on the fort? And that first question, I'm sorry, goes to Mr. Barber. Well, I said some things about this earlier. I'll repeat them and then I add. As a member of the Small Business Committee of the uh, House of Representatives, I've been working from day one when I joined that committee to bring business sense to the Congress. There are not a lot of small business owners in the Congress. It's important that we have people with that kind of experience talking about what businesses need. We've had numerous hearings, including people from Tucson and Cochise County who come back to Washington, D.C. to tell us what they're dealing with and to try to get action. So we passed a bill out of the House uh, Committee on, on Both Small Business that would reduce regulation and would increase access to capital. And that's one of the things that I think we need to make sure continues. We need to get it through the House, over to the Senate, and it needs to be signed into law. Because the number one problem that small businesses face in this country and in this district is the ability to get access to capital. I'll give you an example. I met with a group of small business owners in the district not too long ago. I asked them what the number one problem was. Well, they said it's access to capital. We can't get money to grow. And then it's regulation. So I asked this group, where do you want to get capital? This one woman who owned a business said, you know, I've looked everywhere in Arizona. I can't get capital to increase a business that's been successful 20 years. I had to go to Portugal to get a capital to get a loan. That is dead wrong, and we need to make sure that we open up the ability for small businesses to get uh, loans and lines of credit. And that's why I'm a co-sponsor of a bill that will allow credit unions as well as banks to 
provide small businesses with loans. We hope to get that bill through because we need to expand the number of businesses that can get loans. And by doing so, we need to get institutions that provide finances to be more plentiful. And that's where we, we will go forward. Access to capital, priority one for small businesses, my priority two. Thank you. sure we're championing small business, we need to figure out how to bring in more good paying jobs to our region. And we are in such a strategic location, being right next door to Mexico, and Mexico's economy is growing. And so we've got to make sure that we've got the infrastructure and the ability to capitalize on trade with Mexico. Mexico is our number one trading partner here in Arizona, and right now that trade uh, the infrastructure is going more to Texas and California because we've had stronger leadership there and we need leadership with vision that's actually going to fight to bring us here as a logistical hub so that we can bring you know, jobs here as the trade comes through southern Arizona instead of California and Texas to grow jobs to take advantage of that uh, logistical uh, opportunity. In addition, there's the capability to have dual manufacturing going on on both sides of the border. We've seen some defense, aerospace, and other manufacturing companies that are doing this, where they do some manufacturing here and some in Mexico. So we need someone who's going to be championing that so we can bring, again, some new good jobs here, which will then help the small business, the home builders, and all that, because it's going to actually grow the economy while we're here. We also need to capitalize on our airspace and our weather here. I just I really want to congratulate uh, the Sierra Vista Economic Development Foundation and the hard work they've done bringing in Northrop Grumman and uh, the unmanned aerial systems that are coming in here. Even though Arizona lost the uh, bid for being one of the six uh, states for the FAA uh, experimentation, they're bringing in UAS companies here. They're going to be operating out of Benson and other areas, and that's going to bring good paying jobs. We need to capitalize on that because of the great weather and airspace that we have here, both civilian and defense. We should be growing those opportunities so that we can attract business from all over the world to come to this wonderful place that we call home. We also need to be benefiting from the great universities that we have here and appropriate research dollars coming into the university and supporting things like Tech Launch Arizona, which turns those jobs into startup companies so that they'll put people back to work. Thank you. Well, we do need to build on the high-tech uh, foundation, high-tech industry foundation we have. The defense industry, solar industry, we have the largest number of solar jobs in the nation. In Arizona, 10,000. We can grow that further because we are the center of solar energy in the country. We need to make sure that we grow the optics industry. We have the best optics cluster in the southwest of any place in the country. The defense industry, obviously, is very important, not only to our economy, but to the defense of this country. And I stand firmly with all of those industries in bringing money here. The other thing I would say is that we need to improve the port of entry in Douglas. And I've been working with the mayor and council to get a public-private partnership so that we can make that 1932 port a modern port. So that when the Gulf of Mexico, when, when uh, Lima's uh, port is deepened and more traffic is coming here, Douglas will take advantage of it and so will all of Cochise County will build from that economic base. We've gotten a new customs agents for the Douglas Port. Now we need a new facility, and that's what I'll be working on over the next several months and years. We talked a little bit about defense spending and uh, protecting our interests here at Fort Huachuca. Of course, another big part of that, uh, uh, of national security, is cyber warfare. Uh, so please, would you talk to us a little bit about what you consider would be the necessary steps that federal government should take with internet hacking and our attacks on our system? Sure. So as I mentioned, when I worked for Senator Kyle back in 1999 to 2000, one of my areas that I focused on was actually cybersecurity and cyber terrorism. Uh, there was a great concern even back then of the growing threat from non-state actors and state actors around the world uh, that would potentially impact not just our military, but our financial industries, our critical infrastructure, our power grids, and other things. And so we were raising the alarm bell back then on these threats, and the threats have only gotten worse. Uh, the last course I was teaching at the Marshall Center had to do with cybersecurity and cyberterrorism, and we had people from countries like the country of Georgia and Estonia 
talking about some of the attacks that they've had that were likely out of Russia, though difficult to prove, uh, that were really impacting in, uh, their, in their financial industries and their military capability. We as a military are reliant more than ever on high tech, and we have to make sure that we have the ability to fight in this domain. Domain. It really is a new domain. We have got the air, land, sea, and now this other domain of cyber. And right here again at Fort Huachuca, we have incredible capabilities and expertise in the cyber realm. We need to continue to grow in that area. We need to make sure that the military has the ability to recruit the best and brightest from industry so that we're on the leading edge uh, to protect and be able to, to fight the fight and do what we need to do when we're deployed uh, so that we're not taken down by somebody attacking us in the cyber realm. We also need to make sure as a country for homeland security that we're defending our critical infrastructure and that our financial industry and businesses are not also at threat. So we need to make it easier for them to be able to share information and protect themselves. Uh, and we've got to work very, very closely with them on that. This is something, again, that is a new sort of realm of warfare, and I have tremendous expertise in it, and I intend to bring that uh, to Capitol Hill. When I worked for Kyle, I actually helped it with some of the hearings and writing uh, legislation on this issue, and unfortunately didn't pass back then, but I intend to bring that with me when I get elected. Thank you. It's a very serious issue. I think uh, most citizens don't understand or know the depth of the problem. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I've looked at what we see, what we're dealing with every single day. 10,000 attacks from foreign countries every day. It really boils down to three different sectors that we have to protect. We have to protect our defense sector, not only the Department of Defense, but also the defense industry, because if those cyber attacks can compromise any of those, we are going to be a less secure country. I believe that in DOD, Department of Defense, and to a greater extent in the private sector, a lot of work is being done because it's urgent. But the second sector that's involved with this is the private sector non-defense industry. We have cyber attacks every single day where bad actors from North Korea, from China, from Iran, those are the major culprits, are attacking our private sector industries trying to steal intellectual property. That's a huge problem for our country. We have to stop it. Unfortunately, the private sector still isn't up to speed. It needs to get there. And as the ranking member on the Oversight Committee, Subcommittee of the Homeland Security Committee, I am pressing DHS hard because they have the authority under this administration and executive order to protect the private sector from those attacks. And then the third is something that all of us can be, uh, unfortunately, uh, attacked from. And that is our credit cards, uh, our purchases, and we know that there have been many industries that unfortunately have been compromised, putting uh, consumers at great risk. We have to make sure that every industry, every store, every large corporation has put into place the kind of protections the citizens deserve. This is a very complicated issue. It goes across three sectors. We have to be ready to attack it on all levels, and I'm determined to do that. Yeah, I'll just be brief. I mean, the situation has gotten more and more challenging and difficult over the last three years. People are certainly more concerned, both from a personal safety and security and also at the national level. And it's not gotten any better, so I think it's time for a change. This next question goes to Mr. Barber. And, uh, while we're on the topic of security, uh, those of us who live in Cochise County with 80 miles of border with Mexico are certainly, uh, I, I don't know what the word I use, I will just say that we're still waiting for a solution on border security. Uh, so please give us your thoughts on where you see in the coming year what Congress will do to help us secure our southern border. It's a very important issue to the people that I represent. The biggest problem that we face in Cochise County is found east of Douglas all the way to the border or to the state line of New Mexico. It's an area that's wide open. There are a few fences here and there. We have a few uh, vehicle barriers here and there. But it is an area that is constantly being used by the narco-terrorists, the cartels, 
to bring their wares into our country. Their contraband, heavily armed, into our country. They come through the mountains out of Mexico into the flatlands, and the flatlands is where the people I represent live. We cannot and must not give up one inch of American uh, territory to these cartels. So we need a change of strategy. The Border Patrol, unfortunately, has not got a strategy that is effective in this part of the country. It needs to change. Uh, this morning, I had a conversation with the Secretary of Homeland Security, reiterating again what I said to him when he came out in January. You've got to close this hole. And in that conversation, we talked about several measurements. We talked about getting our Border Patrol agents closer to the border, not 5, 10, 15, 25 miles back. That whole defense in depth concept does not work for us. We need to have a risk-based strategy so we go where the territory is most at risk, and that happens to be right where those people I represent live. He said he would look at that strategy, which is a strategy from the previous administration, and would look to change it. I also suggested that we have aerostats like we have over Sierra Vista. Fifteen of those came back from Afghanistan in good shape. They're stored in an army warehouse. Why don't we get some of them in the air over those mountains so we can have situational awareness of the border? We have a Ford operating base near the border now that we never had before. We need at least one more, if not two. We need to make sure that the federal government does its job to make sure that the border is secure. And I have fought hard to make sure that the aerostats stayed in the air over Sierra Vista when the administration wanted to take it away, and we're going to continue to fight back Thank to make sure the administration does its job. Well, your, your question is actually part of the answer. You said we're waiting here as to when the border is going to be secure. For if anybody was here two years ago, they will remember Ron Barber talking about he's been leading the effort to secure the border since 2006. He said that in the debate two years ago. How is he doing? <laughs> For those who live near the border, and some of them are here in the audience today, I mean, Bill, you live 375 feet from the border. The border is not secure, and it's not getting any better. And so it's time not for talk, but for action. The strategy has failed. It's defense in depth. We need Border Patrol actively patrolling the border. We need intelligence-driven operations so that we know where the corridors of activity are, and we need to be nimble when those corridors change, because as soon as we squeeze them, they're going to move. We need to be using the sensors and the airborne assets to detect and monitor, but we need Border Patrol at the border. So instead of talking about how it's a failed strategy for three years, while we have men and women in this audience that are concerned about going outside their homes safely, we actually need someone who's going to fight to get it done. You may have seen the commercials, but a number of the ranchers who got behind Gabby Giffords and some behind Ron Barber, they've given up. They're ready for a leader who's actually going to get the job done instead of just talking about it. And you know what? Before they uh, adjourn for their summer recess and to go campaign for their next elections, the House did pass a border bill, but Ron Barber lined up with Nancy Pelosi and voted against it. So we're tired here in Southern Arizona of people who talk the talk, but they go to Washington, D.C., and they do something different. It's a public safety issue. This is serious business, and you're not getting the job done, Ron. It's time to send someone there who's actually going to fix the strategy and get the job done, because it's a national security and a public safety threat that's impacting this community deeply. Get it done. 
And as far as that bipartisan bill, or that partisan bill that was passed by the House, only one Democrat voted for it. Why? It didn't do anything to secure the border. It was Michelle Bachman's bill that came to the floor that day, and it was a wrong bill, and it didn't make any sense for border security. I wanted to have a bipartisan bill that does the job, not some showcase bill that we can say, gotcha, Barber, that's not what we need. We need real problems. should be doing, if anything, to protect the river. Sure. Well, look, you know, we're here in the desert, and down um, again here in Cochise County, we know how important water is, right? And so there's been a lot of efforts made in this community uh, in order to make sure that we've got strong conservation related to water. Uh, but what we have right now is extreme elements of the radical left that are trying to do things like shut down Fort Huachuca and hold the generals accountable. The Center for Biological Diversity, I'm sure those who live here are familiar, those who have been busted in probably are familiar, but those who live here are very familiar with this extreme agenda. Uh, and what they're trying to do is shut down the fort. We need to be good stewards of the water resources that we have, and the fort and the city and the county have gone through tremendous efforts over the last several years in conservation, conservation easements, uh, and uh, lots of other different things in order to, my understanding is the Ford actually is going to have a net surplus of water this year. And so we need to let that be directed as locally as possible. Uh, and if there's any appropriate federal funding in order to make sure that we can continue to keep Fort Wichita strong, keep the development in Sierra Vista and this community strong, then I'm absolutely willing to look at that. What I am against, though, is, is these extreme elements that are part of the Obama agenda that are trying to protect the Wachuca water run goal as opposed to protecting Fort Wachuca. And there was a, a very reasonable modification to the Endangered Species Act that came up just recently that would actually allow more transparency to the tactics that these guys use that are very much in the dark uh, for what they call sue and settle. It was a very reasonable adjustment. It was a bipartisan effort. Ten Democrats voted for it, but our current congressman did not vote for it. And so well, I think it's appropriate that though the person who represents this community actually fights to make sure that we have the federal government doing their job, but the federal agencies and these extreme elements uh, not getting involved when the local communities are actually doing the best they can and doing a great job in conservation. And so that should be the focus. The future of Fort Huachuca is inextricably connected to the future of the river. One can't continue without the other. And that's why we have to work very hard to make sure that the, the river is preserved. And Fort Huachuca has done an incredible job. 50% reduction in water use. That is incredible, and we need to have more of that from outside the fort. We also need to back the EPA off when they tried to stop a project that would help the river, we went to bat for that project. Wastewater from Wachuca City was going to be sent to Fort Wachuca for recharge. The EPA got in the way, wouldn't let it happen. We pushed back, we won the day, and that water is now flowing, and that wastewater is flowing to Fort Wachuca to be recharged to help the river, to sustain the river. You know, I think any radical agenda is wrong. That's why I look for common ground in the middle. We must make sure we protect our environment, but we cannot, in the course, in the course of doing that, ruin the economy or ruin Fort Huachuca. The river here is the second most biodiverse region in all of the Americas, except for Costa Rica. It has to be preserved. The beauty of it is wonderful. We have to keep it, but we cannot 
neglect the importance of keeping forward children alive, and we have to make sure both continue. I've been meeting over the years with the Upper San Pedro Partnership, a very wonderful group, a collaborative group that represents the community at large, who has some very outstanding ideas about how to continue to preserve the river. And we need to continue to support the Upper San Pedro Partnership because it is a collaborative effort. The kind of coalition that I'm trying to build in Congress is right here to save the river and consequently to save the fort. And I actually want to go back to the previous question, if that's okay. Uh, you got a standing ovation there, Ron, for the words that you continue to speak about the border while the border continues to not be secure. And I appreciate the men and women that are every single day down there trying to do their job. Many of them are my neighbors, and they are in a very difficult position because they have a failed strategy from D.C. And that failed strategy is putting people like Kelly Glenn Kimbrough, who you may have heard the story, I, I wrote it in an op-ed, no kidding, when she was driving near her ranch and 12 men lied down in front of her in her truck and she had to decide whether she was going to run them over or go forward. She was by herself. She made the decision to stop. She rolled out the window after they climbed all over her truck and spoke to them in Spanish. And they came back and spoke to her in English and said, we're from India, just we want to you know, turn ourselves in. These are the kind of life and death decisions that these people are, are making every single day down on the border. And some of them, again, are here in the audience, and many of them have stepped up and endorsed me. Those that are living on the border, the ranchers are behind me Thank because you. they know you're not getting the job done. Thank you. Okay. 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 There's a, a certain number of registered Republicans, there's a certain number of registered Democrats in, in the state, and then there's a certain number of independents. If you were to switch party roles, so Ron, you're a Republican and you're elected by 51% of the vote, how are you going to represent the other 49% of us? We do it the way we've been doing it for the last two and a half years. And that is, it doesn't matter to me whether you voted for me or not, it doesn't matter to me what your party registration is. We are here to serve you with constituent services that go across all kinds of barriers. No barrier is going to get in the way of us serving the constituents of this community. And that's what we've done in our constituent services office. We have helped citizens of this community, of all of the district, retrieve $17 million in money that was owed to them, veterans and seniors who needed that money to be able to continue their livelihoods. That's why I went to Congress, to serve the people of this community. It doesn't matter to me what your party registration is. That's why I work across the aisle as a member of the bipartisan working group. I sit every other week with Republicans and Democrats alike. We park our agendas and our, and our uh, party labels at the door. We're coming to that room and we say, what can we do to help the American people by doing things that are common ground things? And we have found many of those, and that's what I will continue to do. It really doesn't matter, quite frankly, uh, which party I would represent. I would be the same as I am today as a Democrat going to Congress, because we cannot have this political divide. People are sick and tired of it. Every time I get on a plane to go to Washington, the constituents in this district say, Ron, why can't you guys get something done? And the reason we can't is we have radicals on both sides of the aisle who are keeping us from doing the job that the American people sent us there to do. That's my commitment, no matter which party label I have, and I would be happy to serve regardless. I went there to solve problems, not to get into this contest that we have, this vitriol, this vicious attacks, this ideological freeze that we've got on. People are sick and tired of it, and so am I. And that's why I want to go back to Congress to continue the work I've been doing since I got there to find bipartisan solutions. The National Journal, as I said earlier, made me the fourth most independent member of Congress, a record I'm proud of. Thank you. Cochise County, 80 miles of the border, two military bases. It's about one-third Democrat, 
one third independent, one third Republican. And just like when I was in the military, instead of looking for the things that divide us, uh, and like the attack ads that are always being run against me, I'm looking for the things that are going to deny us. And when I'm talking to people in our community, Democrat, independents, and Republicans, they care about two main things, the economy and security. The economy and security. The economy and security, it doesn't matter what your background is. People are looking for job opportunities. People are looking for safety and security in their senior years to make sure that their retirement savings are going to be protected. People are looking for security at the border. They're looking for security from the threats that we face. The economy and security is what matters most to everybody in this district, right? And what are we going to do in order to fight these things? We need to elect a leader. Not someone who's going to complain about it or be a bystander or talk about congressmen and what they're doing there as if you're not there. People are worse off than they were three years ago or six years ago or eight years ago when you said you've been leading, leading a lot of these efforts wrong. And so what we need is a real independent-minded independent person. I don't consider voting with Nancy Pelosi over 80% of the time independent, especially right now where the country and this district agrees that the Obama agenda is not working. It's not helping people get to work. It's not helping uh, education become more affordable. It's not helping us with our safety and security. And so what we want someone who's actually going to have solutions be pragmatic, be independent-minded, and be a leader. Instead of complaining, actually doing something about it and making things happen, instead of watching things happen and complaining about what's happening. Well, I think it's really important to uh, remind my opponent uh, who runs the agenda in the House of Representatives. Not the party that I, may I finish, please? It's not the party that I'm a member of, but I cross the aisle over and over and over again, and I will continue to do it when I go back, because that's what the American people expect us to do. My opponent, on the other hand, says, oh, she's going to be independent moderate. Let's look at her agenda. Privatizing Social Security and voucherizing Medicare, not in favor of an increase in the minimum wage, on and on and on. That is the agenda of her leadership. There's no way she's going to block her leadership the way I block mine, and I will continue to do so for the people I represent in this county and across this district. tonight, but you left topic X off the list. So the question number 13 is not a closing statement yet. What we're asking you is, would you like to address an issue that has not been addressed yet this evening? Whether we've talked about security, we've talked about economic recovery, we've talked about military spending, we've talked about Affordable Care Act, we've talked about a lot of things, cybersecurity. So, Ms. McSally, we're going to let you bring up an issue that you would like to have addressed that has not been addressed yet that you think is important to our district. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, there's a whole lot more, but I'll talk about one that we were just talking about before I came here today. Uh, the uh, House Chairman of the Veteran Affairs Committee, Jeff Miller, came into town to hold a Veterans Roundtable with me at my VFW post because we're trying to address the dereliction of duty that's gone on at the Veterans Administration and not caring for our veterans and those that have served. We've got about 85,000 veterans in this district, and in this community, about one-third of the community is served. Uh, many of you came to serve at Fort Huachuca and decided to stay because you fell in love with the place. And when those of us who raised our right hand to take an oath and said, here am I, send me, that we're going to put on the uniform, and we're going to go in a harm's way, we have a covenant as a country that we're going to take care of you. And that covenant has been broken. We have a failure of leadership at the Veterans Administration we have people that are more concerned about their bonuses while veterans are dying. We have veterans that can't get access to care, don't know how to navigate the system because it's too complicated, are waiting months and months and months, and many times years, to get a rating from a disability that they incurred by serving their country. We have women that have suffered from military sexual trauma that are not getting the, cap the, the, the care that they need, or even the diagnosis of PTSD that goes along with that. 
We need, that, 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 that promise has been broken, and we need to restore that promise. For those who have served here in the audience tonight, I thank you for that service. It is an absolute travesty that we have an administration that has absolutely failed our veterans and left them with the, without the care that they need. What we need now is somebody who's going to go and fight for veterans in Washington, D.C. We have less than 20% of veterans serving in the Congress right now. We need people to understand what that sacrifice is like to make sure that we put our finger in their chest, we fire the right people, we put them in jail, we investigate, we stop talking about it, we get the access to the care that we need, because this is a covenant, and I will keep that promise to you. Thank you. We agree. The most important thing that's not been discussed tonight is how we serve our veterans. I'm sure many of you in the audience will remember how we treated the veterans, how appallingly we treated the veterans when they came back from Vietnam. We abused them verbally. We called them names. That was disgusting and should never have happened. But worse yet, we neglected to serve them in the way they needed to be served. We didn't know the term PTSD in those days. But what we did know was that these men and women needed help. And now, because of the failure to serve them right, they make up a large percentage of the homeless population in our country. That is wrong. And we need to make sure it doesn't happen to those who are coming back from Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. I have a Veterans Advisory Council representing every major war and conflict we've been in, representing all branches, enlisted and officers, generals, colonels, and sergeants, and privates alike. And they tell me over and over again what we need to be doing to make veterans' lives better. And so, as a result of their input, I took action. The second bill I introduced when I went to Congress back in 2012 was a bill that would ensure that veterans who live far away from a veterans' center got the care they needed right in their town, in Wilcox, and Douglas, and Bisbee, wherever they are, particularly if you have a behavioral health or mental health problem, you don't need to be traveling two and a half hours back and forth to Tucson. You need that care right here. And now I'm glad to say that provision is in the bill we passed just a few weeks ago, a bill that will reform the veteran system by giving $10 billion to the Veterans Administration to contract out for services for veterans who live away from the Veterans Center so that they can get care they need when they need it without having to travel. That's an important provision. We also took away the ability of people at the top to stay in their jobs because they're in covered positions. The secretary now can fire the top people if they do their job in work inappropriately, and that is right. We need to continue to reform this system, and that's what that bill is doing. Thank you. I'm going to take this one minute to give a rebuttal on this campaign. Uh, you know, you guys have seen all the lying attack ads. It's ridiculous. You can't even turn on the TV. And we have a sitting member of Congress who he and his allies have run his entire campaign trying to turn me into someone I'm not, right out of their Democrat playbook based on fear. Scare seniors, scare the middle class, scare women. It's literally all lies. Instead of running on his record and saying, this is why you need to hire me, he's trying to scare people in order to have them not, not vote for me. This is the number one race in the country. I've never said I want to privatize Social Security or voucherize Medicare. The only one in this campaign who has hurt Medicare is the one who repeatedly votes to rob Medicare and pay for Obamacare. And that's the guy over there. Okay? Uh, you know, last year he was here telling me, you know, giving me a hard time because I said I didn't want to raise taxes on the middle class, and now he's running ads saying I want to raise taxes. I mean, this is just bull. This is ridiculous. Look, this is about who's the right person with servant leadership, and please don't be, be moved by fear if anyone in this audience is even undecided. Thank you. being civil. Uh, before we go on, I know the Chamber asked me to uh, make just a couple of short announcements. One is, since we were on the topic of veterans, every year there's a veterans uh, luncheon that gets hosted 
Uh, there's people in the community that are willing to buy the lunch for the veteran to come to the, the TMAC out of Fort Huachuca. And so the Veterans Day luncheon is on November the 5th out of Fort Huachuca. The other thing that we have coming up, of course, is our 56th annual Christmas light parade. 56 years, it's the longest running parade in Arizona. That takes place on December the 6th. The other little piece I want to talk about, you guys are going to miss the closing statements now. The other piece is, is that we're taping this and we will post this on both the Sierra Vista Chamber of Commerce's website and also the Sierra Vista Herald newspaper website. So you'll be able to watch this again if you so desire. Now for closing statements, uh, each get two minutes to close and Ms. McSally, you get to go first. Well, thanks, Phil, and thanks to the Sierra Vista Chamber of Commerce for hosting this. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody who came out tonight to listen. We're 21 days from election day. The biggest question that I get recently is, why are you doing this? Why would anyone put themselves through this? Again, if you turn on the TV, I mean, long after I'm dead, there's going to be videos on the Internet saying that I want to help people commit crimes. I mean, it's just ridiculous. People wonder why good people don't run for office. And I'll tell you, sometimes I ask myself that question, but every day I've gotten up on this campaign trail and I'm stepping up to serve, it's the same reason I put the uniform on every day. We've got some serious problems facing our country and I'm not one who's gonna just walk by that. I'm gonna try and do something about it. I've never been politically active, but I stepped up and said, you know what, I'm gonna do what I can in order to make a difference. I mean, I'm like many of you in the crowd. I came from humble circumstances. I, my, my dad died when I was 12. My mom's now a widow with five kids. I knew education was going to be a great opportunity for me, you know, to, to meet my, my, my dreams in life. But we couldn't afford it, so I joined the military. And I had an amazing experience serving. And I came to Southern Arizona and fell in love, love with the place and I put my roots down, like many of you here. And I am just trying to step up and serve again. The oath of office of a military officer is the same one as a member of Congress, the same exact words. I consider this my next assignment in civilian clothes. It has been a tremendous honor. This has been some of the most remarkable years of my life on the campaign trail. I have met so many people. I am grateful for all the support and the encouragement. I believe in America and I believe in Southern Arizona. Think about it. I mean, here I am, just a middle class woman and a veteran who decided I wanted to run for office. And we are 21 days from me potentially representing you and serving in Congress. I don't have any special interests. I don't have millionaire and billionaire friends. Where are they? I'm looking for them, right? I'm just trying to serve. So let's work together. I'm asking for your vote, and I would be honored to represent you. Thank you. Thank you. Martha's probably right, we won't be changing too many minds in the audience tonight, I suspect, but nevertheless, I'm glad we've had a chance for you to hear, and for others perhaps later, to see on the website uh, what went on here tonight. It's been my deepest honor to serve this community that I've called home since 1959. This is my home, this is the place I love, this is where my children have grown up, my wife is a native of this, this, this part of the state, and I have grandkids here. They are here. I brought something with me tonight. It reminds me of why I'm doing this job. I can't see it, of course, but it's a picture of my wife, my daughters, and my grandchildren. It's their future and the future of every single family like that that I'm in Congress fighting to help. That is why I'm there, for no other reason. My opponent, unfortunately, has begun to morph into somebody that we don't even recognize. You know, you remember uh, a television program, some of you remember a long time ago, that was called To Tell the Truth. We had three people who impersonated a person, one of the people was the real deal. And then the panel had to say which one they thought was the real person. And in the end they said, will the real, whatever the name was, please stand up. And tonight I would like to ask Martha McSally, will the real Martha McSally stand up? Because what you said in 2012 is so different from what you said now. It is quiet, please. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. You know, go back and look at the record. Look at the video.
videos of the debate in 2012, you will find that my opponent favors privatizing Social Security. She wants to voucherize Medicare because she supports the Brock Paul Ryan budget. She would reduce Pell Grants by 23,000 students in Arizona because she supports that budget. She would increase taxes by $1,400 on middle class families and give an increase to the wealthiest people. Thank that's you. All, that's not why. Thank you, I'd like to put you in the camera.